So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the session. My name's Gaynor Rich and I'm the Deputy CSO at BT Group. Um, I am also the Director of Culture Compliance and Assurance um, at BT. But prior to that, um, I was at Unilever and a lot of what we're going to talk to you today about, uh, and Vic was also at Unilever with me, um, is about a lot of the work that we did with uh, building up a business culture of security uh, at Unilever, but, but that is now part of what we are um, doing across the uh, Protect BT part of the organisation. Great, right. and thank you, Gaynor. And uh, my name is Vic Jondo, and I, I lead security culture and education at BT. Um, it's something that I've uh, a role that I've held, held in a number of organisations. First met Gaynor, goodness me, what seven, 20, years, seven years ago? Yeah, seven <laughs> years ago now. Um, so it's been a bit of a, a bit of a shared journey, and uh, we've worked together for for a while at Unilever, building security culture there, which is in a, a, a pretty mature space now. Even though we've, we've both now moved on from that organisation, I then moved on work for. Um, a, a few other, a few other large um, firms before reuniting again with with Gainer last year to start the security culture journey again at BT. So it will jump around a bit, moving from from company to company, but it starts with Unilever and then and then takes us up to the present day and yeah. uh, the challenges we now face. So um, when I landed at Unilever. Um, there was literally nothing in this space, something that, that they referred to um, as white space um, for the organisation. So charged with building up security culture amongst other things in my remit, uh, globally across the organisation was, was quite a big challenge. I mean, where do you start with something like that? Um, and, and the key part for me is actually understanding the organisation. Wh what is the organisation trying to do? What's its purpose? How does it do that? Why is it doing it? Where is it doing it? Um, to think about the different types of people uh, that you need to engage with, understanding what the purpose of the organisation is, and, and being able to hook into that, that capability. Um, Unilever sort of described itself, and, and probably still does, uh, we're just a soup and soap company. Now, they're, they're so much more than a soup and soap company. Um, but you, you sort of get the gist of how they think about it. And, and certainly in the cybersecurity space, you don't think, well, where does cybersecurity fit in with soup and soap? But, you know, they are, you know, one of the largest fast-moving consumer goods companies in the world, the fourth largest in the world. In fact, 400 plus brands, you know, 50 billion euros plus in terms of, of turnover. Um, they are, they have a massive... Um, digital footprint, um, massive sort of transformation programs going on, um, OT, IT, many, many things sort of in, in play. In play. Um, so it is a very, very important aspect for them. So we had to sort of think about what is that, what is that organisation trying to achieve? How do we engage with those individuals in the organisation and understand how we get in, into the, those messages? So a key part of that is actually engaging with the business. And I, I know on the panel this morning, everyone was saying about working, you know, you've got to work alongside the business, but you need to sort of understand the business, um, understand the issues that, that um, exist, you know, and, and the, the old world of issuing a load of do's and don'ts to, to your employees and saying, you know, let's, this is what you have to do, this is how you manage information when you come into the organisation, just doesn't work. So we need to get under the skin of, of all of that. Um, so one of the key aspects for me was, you know, we, we need to be able to communicate with the organisation effectively. Um, and how do we do that? The, the IT community are, you know, bless us all, we're not the best, necessarily the best communicators in terms of helping the organisation understand these things. So for me, one of the key components is actually having a good communicator, um, somebody who, who it's their, their remit, it's their raison d'etre, um, because I can teach them cybersecurity. I can't necessarily teach cybersecurity people to communicate effectively. It's not their skill set, and it shouldn't necessarily be their skill set. So, you know, enter my good friend Vic here on, on the right. Um, I think when we first met, um, Cybersecurity wasn't your gig, was it? And nope, I, no, I, it was business change, transformation, communications. But and at not the time, cyber. I promised him I'd make him a unicorn. He was quite <laughs> unicorn. So please meet one of my unicorns. I have created two in my in my life, but um, 
uh, not so they're not so unique now. I think a lot of other organisations have, have picked up on this this sort of message of actually using uh, communications professionals in the cyber security space. Um, but it, but it is a key key aspect of what what we do. The next side of it was actually um, having been um, in a very federated organisation prior to that was I, I knew how how territorial it can be. Um, so it was actually building a network of champions across the organisation, um, working with lead, senior leaders in the organisation, both on the risk side and the IT side. It was very important for me to find not just IT champions, but I wanted business champions because they give me a much more holistic view of, of what's going on in the organisation. Um, so we set about recruiting these people. They were volunteers doing something over and above their day job. Um, but we had uh, over a hundred of them across the organisation because uh, Unilever's organised in terms of sort of product categories which go laterally across the organisation but in geographical regions as well. So we needed to cover the whole globe. So we built, we got a range of, of pairings of, of IT and business champions across the organisation and they were our communications channel because I don't know whether any of you have come across the, the group comms police but we've come across it in, <laughs> everywhere we've been. Um, and so this was my way of uh, disrupting, if you like, but finding a way of, uh, by building these champions, that we could produce some materials and get them communicated to the organisation. But what it helped us do was actually translate common messages into local language, but not just language as in, in you know, normal speech language, actually thinking about the cultural differences, not just geographically, but in terms of business, because every part of the organisation, no matter how big or small, has its different cultures across the organisation. And so they enabled us to, to deliver them a common message, but in a way that was receptive to the organisation uh, and that people could, could digest and relate to. Um, they were also our eyes and ears on the ground. Yeah. So, you know, that they, we gave them job descriptions, uh, we gave them goals as well because it, it helps engage people. One, it gives them a clear remit of what they're doing, even though they're doing it as a volunteer. But it also gave, gave them and us a means of measuring performance uh, and, and then being able to see who was really participating, who wasn't. But also as part of their performance review to show value to, the, to their managers and leaders as well. But that unvarnished feedback is really, really valuable. It might hurt sometimes, it might feel slightly uncomfortable, but it's really, really valuable because it helped us shape and move and make sure that the program was continuing to resonate with, with the different parts of the organisation. So they were absolutely critical. Yeah. What other components did we have? Oh, goodness. Um, so at, at, uh, certainly at Unilever, we had uh, one, one of the big things, I think, was the information hub, the what we call the, IP, the IPZ or IPZ, the Information Protection Zone the one stop, creating a one stop shop for everybody to go to for really easy user guides, FAQs, security news, policies and standards, but making those policies and standards accessible and relevant to their day to day work. Also for downloadable campaign materials as well, um, fixed along the lines of behavioral themes. So really making it action orientated, uh, communicating exactly what we want them to do and how we want them to do it, but also being cognizant of the fact that it's very different landing it in different countries. But some of the things we learned as well is uh, the way the way communications or, or, or marketing materials around security lands and works in different regions and different countries. The way things are embraced, say, in the UK yeah. or in Germany or in the Netherlands, got a big, big presence in the Netherlands, of course, uh, Unilever is very different from India, another massive market. But what stimulates the Indian, the Indian market or employees in the Indian market is so different to what stimulates employees here or maybe in the States. Yeah, absolutely. OK, over to me for this one. So um, I said we were going to jump around a little bit in terms of organizations. So I left Unilever in, in 2017 and one of the organizations I landed at was an investment bank and, and this is where I, I started really looking at this setting the tone from the top for me it is critically important if you are going to engender a big culture change to have your senior leaders on board 
it is massively important. They've got to walk the walk. They've got to talk the talk. And but but in order to do that, though, we have got to be able to translate those security messages for them. Shane, you made a, an excellent point this morning, and I happen to be agree 100 percent. They talk in the language of risk, talk in the language of money. So we have to to coach ourselves rather than talking about tech and widgets and tooling to talk about risk, whether that's monetary risk, regulatory risk or, or uh, reputational risk. Uh, so speaking to them in the language of risk really does, as we know, start to get their attention. But the, there is a challenge here, though. You can speak in the language of risk, but what happens, though, if you're in an organization that perhaps hasn't had a, a major data incident for many years? What happens also when you have, uh, when you have uh, a C-suite or uh, an exco or senior management team underneath that, whereby um, heads have changed? We often see in large organizations that in the C-suite, uh, those, uh, those, those members of the C-suite can often change within two or three years very, very rapidly. What about the knowledge aspect of that, the knowledge management aspect of that, the knowledge transfer of that? Because new leaders come in and they've got their own big ideas and they want to change things. And for them, security may be right down the pecking order in their priorities. They're looking at making a big impact quickly. And sometimes that means bypassing security, which obviously keeps us awake at night. But we have to convey the message of security's importance. Yeah. So that's why setting the tone from the top is important. It, Sorry, again. Yeah, again. so it's aligning aligning security with the business enabling. It's to deliver, it, and that's why it's important to understand the purpose of the organisation because we have to be able to talk about security and security culture in a way that aligns with delivering the business objectives and purpose because. Otherwise, we end up with um, security can be seen as a, like a, a sales contraceptive because everyone's going, oh, everyone wants to lock everything down and we can't get anything done. But, but contraceptive. Because we can, we, we, we can lock stuff, <laughs> we can lock stuff down. But, you know, we've got to be there and we're there to enable the business to operate securely. So that that's the important yeah. message that we have to align with I'm, the leaders. I'm just going to um, make another point on this one before mo moving on. Um, so what, so what, uh, what is needed is a reg regular flow of communications and engagement with them, not just reporting. And uh, the example I'm going to use is um, when I was working at an investment bank a couple of years ago, they were reviewed and externally audited as well. And it was shown that um, in terms of this, their exco and board, they were nodding dogs when it came to security. So the, the, the topic of security would come up and they would just nod along to what they were being told because they simply didn't understand it. They didn't have the knowledge to challenge their senior management teams on cyber risk. So I introduced the program of engagement and education for that C-suite and the, and the levels below that. And then I extended it to senior management teams in various in, in the various uh, country and regional footprint of the bank as well to help that education piece because it is not just about setting the tone from the top. It's not just about giving them some key messages to say. It's about educating them about why this is important so that they can then, when they do convey that message, it's authentic mm. and they live it and breathe it. So I'll move on. So um, what, another key pillar of this is actually building a brand, building something that is recognisable, that, that people identify with, with security messages, but not in a sort of, oh God, here's another security message type view, but actually something that people, engages people and, and gets them to um, think about the topic. Um, and some, some key things are, you know, a bit of a challenge within Unilever, but again, disrupting, creating a brand within a brand. So we created a brand, you can see the brand logo low there. And, but we had sort of colours, again, the colours were very important. You won't believe the level of debate that went on around colours, but uh, that's another story. But anyway, we landed on the colours um, and, and the design logo and, and started to roll that out and put that onto everything. Uh, and, and we also introduced a character, and again, the debate around the character was quite interesting. Because, um, but anyway, <laughs> it, it had to be um, gender neutral, racially non-specific. Ended up as a green square and a hat, but but in, always got referred to as he for some unknown reason. Not not by but by everybody. It was the hat. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, so we introduced the character and ten, 10 security behaviours because this what we wanted to do was not, you know, we're moving away from that do's and don'ts thing and actually thinking about behaviours that worked 
for people and help people protect themselves and their families so that it this is sort of the part of getting it into the DNA. So you, this is this is good behaviour. This is what you do. This is how to do it. Um, and you can share this with your friends, your family and everybody and make it real. Um, you don't have to think differently when you come into work. You just if you just use these behaviours wherever you go, then you're going to be say, mm. you know, you're going to help protect yourself. But it also protects the organisation. And that was a really positive message. Um, to get people engaged and, and, and Beanie appeared in videos and on posters and, and all the usual stuff. And, and, that, and that is an embarrassing picture of me yeah, with his in green screen <laughs> with character in the background. That was a cyber superhero campaign. Yeah, I'll never forgive you for that image. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, yeah, so, but it was introducing that in a way that engaged people and, and captured their attention and they saw the messages, they saw the colours, they saw the logo, they knew it was a message and actually people responded really, really positive positively to that but we to, to to actually sort of bring that alive we had to create the relevant sort of assets and I'll let you talk about assets yeah and and, and I mentioned the information uh, protection zone that we created the the the, the one-stop shop hub uh, and and that really did turn into a, a proper hub because we then managed to create a series of animated uh, animated videos we had um, together with the the branding the logo the strap line the colors we were able to create uh, uh, marketing assets almost downloadable assets uh, along those 10 themes that you can see there uh, that meant that our security champions which um, we uh, Gaynor mentioned earlier can then la land those in local language as well um, into their into their territories into their countries into their regions and into their business functions as well so having that drawdown of regular uh, assets that are developed that have the same sort of look and feel um, but contain those sort of energizing capability based messages that everybody could act upon as you say not just at work but also at home as well. It's how we got around the group comms police because we could issue the toolkits to them via email and they could print them off locally and, and put them onto they dealt with the local comms team so it, it actually helped us get around that piece. Yeah. We did make friends with group comms eventually they came around to our way of thinking thankfully yeah. but um, yeah it, it, is a, it is a pattern with us. It was a challenge yeah. it was a challenge. Um, yeah, so that those those assets are very important. So there's yeah. consistency. Um, but then you know we we needed to you have to sort of keep it fresh. You have to move on, and there's there's a different way of thinking about things. So um, Be Beanie sort of actually took on a life of his own. He had children, and all sorts of things went on. But it came time we think we we need to freshen this up. We need to take a different look at this. Um, and so Beanie retired, and there was actually much sadness from from everybody when he left surprisingly so but anyway we, we we decided to simplify and focus and we focused down on five key behaviors um, and we looked at actually redesigning the sort of marketing campaigns because we were we were we'd taken the view of marketing cybersecurity to marketeers um, and that that's where we'd sort of started with those regular campaigns of activity um, but we needed to think about it slightly differently. So we, we actually struck on um, animals um, because animals, animals are non-threatening. They're soft, they're attractive to, they have face shapes. So we actually are programmed to look for face shapes. Um, but we did the, we produced the collateral in the color scheme. So you saw it was sort of a teal and a purple. So you had like different animals. So it was like a fox with a feather representing um, reporting incidents. And it was amazing how many people sort of like, why is there a purple fox on the screen over the coffee machine? But it drew them in to read the materials because they'd, they'd sort of see the animal. It's nice and fluffy. We had a dog protecting a ball for protecting information and a, a cat watching a bird on a wire for being safe online, things like that. But it, and, we, and we redesigned all the collateral. Um, but at this time, we also um, did a partnership with UCL um, looking at their sort of psychoanalytical techniques and we put all of our materials through their analysis lab and it was really really interesting because we, we, it one it helped validate actually how successful the logo and the materials were but it also gave us so many so many more opportunities to learn and understand why things were successful and the face shapes is really really key um, because it, what they found was it was drawing people to read the read the materials um, 
it, it's th th that face shape is a primal thing. You can't help yourself. You'll look for face shapes wherever you go. And it's one of the reasons why warning road signs are triangular shape, because it's a face shape. So it makes you take attention to it. You can't help yourself. Um, and and uh, sort of some of this learning helped us understand um, what, we were, what we were trying to do. Um, it also helped us understand that unwittingly, we designed a logo that was really, really powerful because again, it's soft and squidgy. We naturally find it non-threatening, so we'll be attracted to it. And that's what draws people to read the material. Um, we often go in security, you often see spiky shapes. Uh, these spiky shapes, it's a bit like somebody honking their horn at you. It gets your attention briefly, but it doesn't hold your attention because it's actually quite threatening. Um, so it's l these sorts of lessons that helped us sort of learn and understand how we made the materials more effective. And the simple things like they said to us, make the animal's eyes look at the text because people were looking at our logo, tracking down to the animals and they were looking at the text, but they want we wanted to increase the dwell time there. So they said, if you make the eyes look at the text, Again, human beings, we can't help ourselves. If I started looking over there, eventually you'd all start looking over there because you'd think, well, what's she looking at? And that's, that, that's how we sort of leverage that to sort of help with the materials um, and leverage that. We, we also sort of, we, we also sort of took this through as we, as we sort of started to roll out more, more tools and techniques like fishing buttons and, and fishing reporting capabilities. We were doing all the usual stuff. Um, it hadn't been done before, but we, we were doing all of that. But it, it, it's, it's using that psychology to get people to engage with it. And certainly the engagement through having a fishing button, people were sick and tired of reporting fishing because they had to attach it to an email and then they had to send it off and they got no response. Whereas the button in a very simple way actually rewarded people because it said, thank you for reporting it. It told them if it was malicious, it, it took it out of their inbox if it was malicious. Uh, it told them if it was a fishing exercise and that really, really engaged people in it. Everything we did around fishing was positive. It wasn't, we're gonna beat you up when it's three strikes and you're out and you're gonna, it was all about thank you for doing that, understanding what's, what's going on. Um, and, 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 and enabling people to engage with the process. And, and it was a really, people actually enjoyed the fishing resilience training um, because they saw different aspects to it and, and it helped them understand. But what, from this, we were getting a richness of data and we were seeing different geographical regions be responding in different ways. And we had two, two outliers, China and Latin America, who were really good at not clicking on emails but really rubbish at reporting, which was our main focus, because actually we had quite a low click rate. And it was through working with UCL that we, we, we tried lots of different things, but they helped us understand, again, the psychology of this type of thing. And one of the primal things, again, programmed into us all is we, we are troop animals. We want to belong. We don't like to be an outlier. And they illustrated this to us in some work that they'd done with hotel towels, where you, you know, you see on a, on a, wall or, you know, reuse your towel, help us save the planet. And actually as human beings, we can't relate to that concept. It's too big world. You're one person, one towel. It's not going to make a lot of difference. But if you tip that on its head and say, 83% of our customers reuse their towel, that's helping us save the planet. People say, oh, everybody else is doing it. And so they, they start to join, join in with the, with the program. They don't want to be an outlier. And you saw this through the pandemic with the mask wearing aspect and government promotions. You're, you know, you're protecting others by wearing your mask. It makes you feel like an outlier if you don't do it. And we tried this out with our fishing um, training in, in those particular areas um, because there were, there were different cultural reasons why they were doing it. But the, these psychological aspects are regardless of, of culture. Um, that occur and actually it was really really effective it has to be an odd number for some reason um, but that 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 works and we increased the reporting rate by 500 percent so it was a really really effective exercise mm. and and um, and a, 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 a common bedfellow of course in terms of theming when it comes to fishing of course is the incident reporting because that's something that we we track with of course with fishing simulations and what, what I have found certainly with the organizations I've worked for and it, and it was the case at Unilever when I was there too is really uh, needing to build a culture of incident reporting, getting people to be much, much more aware about what to report, when to report, how to report, and so on, and building that into the DNA of every, um, every individual. But we got to meet people halfway, so we can tell people that it's important to report, but we've got to make it easy for them. Um, so many organizations 
um, that I've, I've, I've worked with or I've had colleagues that have worked there and they've, and they've talked to me at, at industry events such as this. There are five, six, seven steps in order to formally report an incident. That can't be right. We've got to make it very, very easy for people to report because that will help us to yeah. uh, to protect and prevent. And it's like the panel was saying this morning, it's about making people feel part of it. It, yeah. it, it we're all in it together. It's a shared responsibility. Yeah, and closing that communications loop as well. So I'm conscious we're running out of time. Yeah. But very quickly, I mean, how do we know it's working? It's really, really important to have um, measures and metrics um, that are at, at quite a granular level because that, that is the key thing to feeding into are we going in the right direction? Have what well, has what we've done delivered what we expected? You know, if we deliver some training, is there is there a bounce back in terms of value? Benchmarking where you are to start with is a really really good good aspect of that. And if you can do that externally to compare yourself to your peers, or whatever, mm -hmm. that that's really helpful. But but having those sort of granular metrics, we were able to see those differences in the responses across the different geographies. We could actually get right down to business units. Um, obviously, data protection protects you prevents you from getting any lower than that. But having those metrics to help you course correct, validate what you're doing, it helps reassure the executive as well and the organisation. Um, and we eventually got to dashboards with each of the geogra geographical regions so that we could actually have a, an informed discussion about them. And it, it's amazing how competitive that becomes. Mm -hmm. But we, what we showed was, you know, this is your training statistics across all of the things that we were doing and your performance. Uh, against incident data. So there was, there was a direct correlation between where training was good, where they were doing really really well on all of the sort of training and education metrics, incidents were less. And that, that really got people's attention. Um, and it, you know, we, we thought that was the case, but the metrics actually validated that and it re really made a, a difference in getting traction. Yeah, sometimes it can even be, even be related to employee satisfaction scores more holistically. So the happier your organization is, the better your security tends to be as well. Because, go, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, it also enabled us to do targeted education programs. Mm. So where we identified areas needed extra training, we could do support packages for them. So it became much more granular, much more tailored, rather than the sort of, we started with a common message, it became much more tailored to yeah. the individual units. Okay. Uh, so I'll talk very quickly about breaking down barriers. Um, this is really about getting security out of the security department. Um, you know, cybersecurity can be seen as wizardry in the centre of the organisation. Um, and, and I guess, you know, as a community, we maybe haven't helped that in, you know, it's quite good to be a little bit, you know, um, do we all be doing all this stuff? But we need to, we need to break down those barriers. We need to, you know, the organisation is so, um, diversified now and the boundaries and the borders, are, uh, are, you know, risk decision making is being made all over the organisation. So we need everybody to be a security yeah. expert. Uh, we need to enable that to happen and we need people to understand that this isn't just happening to other organisations that you hear about in the media. This is happening to our organisation. We need to share as much information as we can as possible. Some things I know appreciate are sensitive, but the more you can break down those barriers and help people understand. I mean, we were very fortunate to get the CFO to go on video talking about um, nearly getting we conned out of a load of money on Christmas Eve, believe it or not, in, in, you know, uh, through the organisation. But we also had run a big campaign of getting other people to talk about stories that they'd experienced in their lives. And it really brought it to life for people. So it helped break down those barriers, make people feel more part of it. Yeah. I'll skip over what we've achieved because we've got down to one minute. So yeah. we can't do that. <laughs> so what, <laughs> we've so achieved a lot. I'm not happy exactly. to talk about it. <laughs> so what, so what next for us? Well, um, we're, we're now both landed. Uh, we're now both landed at BT, and we have a, a similar yeah. similar challenge with another large organisation with its own unique culture as well and its own unique history uh, as well. But. In terms of what we're, we've got going on, we have an integrated security uh, strategy, but most exciting for me is security culture is a big part of that strategy. It's a pillar in its own right, but it also underpins um, all the other pillars as well. So for me personally, it's an, an exciting time. Uh, BT has, has shown, um, shown its intent by um, putting together or helping me put together a quite sizable security culture team. You know, a couple of months ago, it was just me. It is now 10 people uh, and, and uh, it really does show that BT is now taking this very, very seriously and sees culture as a part of the overall security journey.